Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from my side as well. Um, it's very good that I see some familiar names on the attendee list. Um, so I hope everybody can, or at least Karsten can confirm that um, you can- I can make... confirm that we see your slides, yes. Fantastic. Um, so it's a very great pleasure to, to be here um, today and that I can share some of our research with all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to focus this on not particular methods, but, but, but more approaches and, and show you how you could possibly do thing, things like that, that that I'm going to show to you um, at, in your own research and sort of at home if you uh, want to. Peter, real quick, um, I would like to interrupt for one second uh, because for our audience, we have a poll here. Um, a poll we would like to know, um, first of all, what uh, the position is that you are currently in. So we have a quick poll here and we would like to ask you to answer these questions as good as, as, good as possible. So uh, please select from the following. You are either a medicinal or a bench chemist, a computational chemist, a molecular biologist or crystallographer, a manager or decision maker or none of the above. And I can see the votes coming in here. I'll give you just a little more time. And I will close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. I will close now. And so that's what the audience today is composed of. We have 20% medicinal chemists, 52% computational chemists, which I think is an excellent match for what you're presenting today, Peter. Um, then we have uh, a molecular biologist, 13%, 10% managers, and none of the above five. Um, and then I have a second poll here real quick, um, where you work in, if you are in academia or in a commercial company. So that goes rather quickly. Votes coming in, give you a few seconds more time. And I will close in five, four, three, two, one. So let's see. So we have 68% academia and 33% commercial company. Very well, thank you so much. And then I will hand it back to you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's very informative for me as well. So what I'm going to try to do tonight or today um, is sharing a few stories with you. And I'd like to start by um, thanking the people Quickly, yep. Um, thanking the people that, who have been working with me in the past um, and done some of the research and also some of our collaboration partners and of course funding. So I will share stories by Florent, um, who obviously is sitting here um, today. Some stories that, that Dennis has uh, Schmidt has been doing in my lab, and we have a ton of very great collaboration partners um, because we strive to evaluate all of our um, computational predictions also in real life and, and at the bench and whatever the essay uh, may be. So for those of you who do not yet know me so well, um, this is a word cloud from recent abstracts from our publications. And you can see that docking is, is one of our favorite methods. And we are applying this to receptors, specifically G protein coupled receptors. You see them in orange up here. Um, we have structure-based people, so we're using the protein structure as a query in order to find novel ligands um, for whatever tar tar uh, disease-relevant target we have. And we are interested in biophysical methods of assaying our predictions. You see that here exemplified by the, by the keyword binding. We're looking for ligands, we're looking for inhibitors, um, and trying to also learn more about the underlying biological system. So in short, the, today's talk is going to be about GPCRs, computational chemistry, and also a dash of medicinal chemistry added in, because that's where I see the future um, of this field also going, that we can not only aid the biological people, but also people who are working in synthesis labs. So for those of you who do not know docking, um, this is what my lab is doing on a daily basis. We're playing these kinds of games. We're trying to find for a particular binding pocket on this cube here, the, the yellow um, hole, we're trying to find the optimal ligand. 
And as any of you who have already done this will know, this is not a chil children's game. I mean, we, we can't do that in kindergarten um, because the binding pocket is much more rugged. It's much more complicated. Presumably, it's also moving in most of the cases. Plus, the little blocks that we have to try are on the order of hundreds of millions of, of possibilities. So it's, it's kind of a tough problem to do. Now, docking is a um, structure-based method. So that means we'll rely on the protein structure. So I have depicted the GPCR in blue up here to the right. We have a database of many millions of molecules. Currently, we are routinely docking on the order of 5 million molecules. And in the computer, every individual one of these library molecules is put into the binding pocket of the receptor, evaluated for its steric fit and also its complementarity in terms of electrostatics and, and other features. Um, and every molecule is then ranked, which means that it receives a score. And these scores can be ranked from the best to the worst. We visually inspect um, these predictions. We go to the experiment. And very importantly, in, at least for my lab, um, the experiment feeds back into the docking calculations. So we try to improve them. And at the end, we will find, hopefully, we will find ligands. Now, one time we think that docking is, is a worthwhile uh, pastime. One thing is that, with any, as with any computational method, um, we can dock existing and virtual molecules. So we can try to answer the question from your fellow bench chemists, what molecule should I try to make next as a ligand? Because we can dock a lot of different predictions of virtual molecules and try to find those that have the best fit. We can also try to tackle orphan targets, and particularly in the GPCR field, um, there are a lot of receptors where we do know that they are proteins, where we do know that they have a function, um, or we suspect that they have a function, but we do not know natural ligand. We routinely also discover novel chemotypes, um, so molecules that have a different 2D layout than ligands that have already been known for, for certain targets. Now, I have already mentioned GPCRs, and some of you might be familiar with those, but here's a little intro in, into uh, these very important receptors. So they are the most frequently targeted class of proteins uh, by current, currently uh, marketed drugs. And so they consist of seven alpha helices that span the membrane of, of a cell. And these receptors mediate signals into the cell. So a cell has to know what is going out, outside of it. And when one of these ligands comes, for instance, adrenaline, which is very likely when you're giving a presentation or when you're taking an exam or something, it binds to the receptor, and the receptor undergoes a conformational change. So if I flip, oops, you flip back and forth here, you will see that I have symbolically done this um, also with the colors that the receptor changes its conformation upon binding of the ligand. And this allows the effect of proteins on the intracellular side to bind, most of all, the, the name giving G proteins here but also other effector proteins, such as beta arrestin and so forth. And then signals are mediated into the cell. Now, when such ligands can have a different effects on a GPCR. So adrenaline, of course, is a stimulant. Um, but based on the observation that many receptors have basal signaling activity, which means that they signal a little bit also in the ab complete absence of any stimulating ligands. This is a bit like you have a radio and, and you're not yet tuned into a particular station, so you hear this white static noise. This is just a bit of signal, but it's not, you know, very, it's not very exciting to listen to and it's not very information carrying. So if you have a receptor that has this basal signaling activity and you have a molecule that stimulates it, it's called an agonist. Um, when it does the exact reverse, so it attenuates the signal, we call it an inverse agonist. And the natural ligand, or the, the most potent, the most efficacious ligands in these categories, they are sort of called the agonists, and they define the maximum stimulation or the maximum attenuation possible. And any other molecule is relatively to those molecules classified as partial, a partial agonist, a partial inverse agonist. A molecule that would just expel an agonist from the binding pocket, but not stimulate the receptor any further, would be a neutral antagonist. And so there is this 
discussion going on. When is a molecule going to be an agonist or an inverse agonist? And this is something that we are trying to actively investigate. Now, a couple of years or decades ago, there was this binary picture of G protein coupled receptors. So they would exist here in an inactive conformation or in a basal state. And I depict here different signaling pathways by these little triangles and the magnitude is supposed to be uh, indicative of how much a certain pathway is, is uh, transporting signal. And on the other hand, we would have the fully activated GPCR, which consists of a ternary complex formed of the ligand that is bound. We have the receptor and we have the G protein bound. And that's the maximum stimulation that you can get. But now, from the many great crystal structures that have been solved in the past years, we know that there is an entire spectrum from completely inactive to completely active um, that's going on. And so I tried to symbolize this here with uh, going from, from blue to, to yellow. And so you have a number of different states in between. So um, a molecule that would just bind to the basal state but not change it is an antagonist. An inverse agonist binds um, and attenuates all the possible signals, as you can see here to the left. And then we have agonists which stimulate, and if they do not stimulate all the pathways in the same manner, if they do not recruit all the effector proteins at the same rate, then we call them biased agonists. And so there's this entire spectrum, and we think, and to a certain extent, we have um, we have confirmation that this is the case. We think that the precise confirmation of the receptor is governing what the answer is going to be to the intracellular side. And it's the ligand that elicits or stabilizes these certain um, conformations of the receptor. Now, this is not just a fantasy of somebody who is doing computational chemistry. It's also shown by recent experiments from the Steyr lab in, at the University of Brussels. So what they are doing is they have nanobodies, which are very simple antibodies. And so they have constructed two fusion proteins. So one is the receptor that's um, in blue here on the bottom left. It's fused to a nanobody that stabilizes the receptor in an active conformation. And on the other hand, they have fused the same receptor, the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, which I will introduce in a moment a little bit better. Um, they have fused it to an irrelevant nanobody. So this is in its basal or inactive state. Now, when you measure known ligands with a known efficacy profile, so isoproteranol is an agonist. You can see that it binds better from the curve up here. It, the green curve is to the left of the red curve, which means it has a higher affinity for the active state of the receptor. So green is all, means always active in this presentation, and red means inactive um, conformation. Alprenolol is a bit more balanced, and ICI-118551 depicted to the right. You can see that the red curve is to the left of the green curve, which means it has a higher affinity for the basal state. And ICI-118551 indeed is an inverse agonist. So this difference in affinity to different conformations is also borne out in experiment that when you take, when we, we have a paper with, together with um, the Stared Lab, where they hunted and we modified the ligands that came out as potential agonists in, these, in this essay, and were then later confirmed in cellular assays that they actually do act as agonists in these circumstances. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Um, because it's very um, nice to, as structure, with a structure-based method, to go hunt for novel ligands with tailored efficacy profiles. And we can, we, we believe that we can do this, and we have also um, published results that show that we can do this by docking a library to do the two different conformations of um, the receptor. And from the differential docking mode, we can take a look at this. But let me go back a little bit in history. So this was the first time I was working with beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And just to show you a little bit what the power of docking is in terms of finding ligands that have no, um, or the, with, of, of, of chemical structure that has not never been described for, for a receptor before, I'm going to show you the, the following study. And so this came about when Brian Kubelka solved the X-ray structure of the beta 2 adrenergic receptor back in 2007. Um, and 
uh, there was wood during the time that I was in San Francisco and he's in Stanford. And so we, we um, got wind of this and we started to talk to this receptor and the um, pocket that we're interested in is the binding pocket here. So what you have to imagine that to the left here um, and to the right here, this would be the membrane where the receptor is sitting in. Um, what you see at the bottom is the T4 lysozyme, which they used instead of the very floppy intracellular loop three and floppy and crystallography don't go well together. So they, they uh, substituted this um, floppy ring with T4 lysozyme, which provides nice crystal contacts. Now, when we look, take a closer look at the binding pocket, and this is also one of the reasons why GPCRs usually work very, very well with um, uh, docking methods. What I have done is I have cut away the helices that would be between us and the binding pocket. And here you see carazolol, that's the ligand of the crystal structure that has been crystallized back then. Um, and you can see that it fits very nicely inside this pocket, just from, from a shape standpoint. If we switch on the interactions, you see that there is a key aspartate residue, which forms a salt bridge with a positively charged nitrogen here. Which and this positively charged nitrogen, this is a feature that all known ligands of the beta tuaternergic receptor have. You see a couple of um, polar interactions also at the other end to the left, and of course aromatic interactions and so forth. Now, at the point in time where we had been started to dock, um, medicinal chemistry had been doing a great job for over 60 years. Back, they started back in the 50s of the last century. And when you look at the canonical ligand, this is adrenaline depicted down here, you see that it has an aliphatic amine to the right. Then there are two carbons, then there is a hydroxy group, and then in another carbon distance, there is an aromatic moiety. And you can find this blueprint in all the other ligands that I have depicted here. You have an amine, hydroxy group, something aromatic. And I'm not going through every single one of these ligands. Of course, they look very different. Of course, they are outside of each other's patterns but you can see where they got the idea from. And this was the challenge that we wanted to take when we first tried to talk to this receptor. Can we find something that's completely crazy in terms of it's completely unprecedented for this particular target? And so we talked a relatively small library of about 1 million molecules back then. And here are five of the, uh, sorry, six of the ligands that we found back then. And when we look at ligands one, two, three, and four first, so these are the ones top left and the bottom row, you could now say, well, I could have told you with the information that you have already given me, there's an aliphatic amine, there's a better hydroxy group, there is something aromatic on the left side. Um, this is also true for these biphenyls with the exception of the hydroxy group. What is surprising is the affinity. If you look at compound number one, it's a nine nanomolar ligand straight out of docking. Um, we later discovered that this has already been described um, sometimes in the, in the 70s, but as an anti-helmintic. Um, so it was, it was um, not ob immediately obvious that this would also bind to the beta tuaternergic receptor. What we were still more excited about are the two molecules uh, that have just switched to orange now. And if you look at molecule six first, this is still the same blueprint, but now you have uh, the amine in a cyclic structure and you have the hydroxy group hanging off of the aromatic moiety. So this is beginning to start looking mildly novel. And what we're most happy about is the molecule here in the middle, uh, the benzothiazole, which has a positively charged nitrogen, which is also constitutively positively charged. You can see that the positive charge can also go over to the other nitrogen. And we think that this constitutive positive charge is a key feature why this is a binder. Now, all of these molecules are in the single digit micromolar range, so, so pretty good if you consider that adrenaline has an affinity of around about 100 nanomolar. Now, we were so fortunate that for the most potent compound, the nine nanomolar one, um, our collaborator, uh, Ray Stevens, took up this molecule and solve the crystal structure with it. And this was exciting because for structure-based people, it's not just cool to have ligands, but we also want to be right for the right reasons, which means we want to get the docking mode right. I mean, this is not just so that we can, you know, make a nice poster and say, hey, I got it right. But if you think about medicinal chemistry, it's very important to know that, for instance, you can grow on the right side here, um, but you cannot grow 
on the left side here because you would immediately clash into the protein. So this is this is why it's important that our predictions are correct. What you see here in yellow carbons is the docked molecule, and in orange carbons is the X-ray structure, and this is a, a 0.9 angstrom RMSD. So essentially, it's, it's spot on. And I will return to these binding modes then a little bit later. Now, the next thing that we did back then is to try to investigate chemical space a little bit more, particularly for the novel molecules. Um, it would be interesting to see whether these are singletons in chemical space or whether these are molecules which have fellows that also bind. So on the one hand, we did a ligand similarity search, so we deviated from our structure-based um, techniques, but we also did a stru structure-based search and got a number of hits from the same database, and um, we docked all of them and um, assayed them. And these are just a couple of molecules that we additionally found. And if you look on the, on the left side, you see that the thiazoles indeed seem to be a novel scaffold that also binds in several different variants. The curious thing is, what well, I do not show on this slide, but I should, we show it in the paper, if you substitute this sulfur with an oxygen, um, the molecule loses its affinity. So it, it, there seems to be a distinct electronic component to this entire thing. So we can also um, extend these series by docking. Now, one challenge that we also had um, is whether we would find any fragment-like binders. So these are relatively small compounds, which um, we were, uh, the, the Kleber lab in this building also works on. Um, it's one of their favorite things. So they are very versatile because they bind in a lot of different binding modes. But on the other hand, because they are so small, they have a relatively low affinity. They have a very good ligand efficiency, so a contribution per atom. And this is one of the compounds or one of the fragments that we found here on the left side. So this is not a crystal structure binding mode, but this is our docking prediction. But you can see that it sort of makes sense if you think about what I told you before. Keep this molecule in mind because we're going to modify it in a second. Now, what we have then asked ourselves at this point um, is, do we really, are we stuck with the 8 million compounds that zinc has that you can buy off the shelf ready made? Um, or can we try to expand this? And so what we have been doing, but this has also been, been done by, by lots of other people, is we try to go into easily accessible chemical space. Now, this is my artistic impression of what chemical space might look like. So you have uh, lots of molecules around there, and there are estimates that 10 to the power of 60 molecules might exist. Um, if you think that we have 10 to the power of 57 atoms in our universe, uh, in our solar system. It is relatively clear that even if we break up every molecule that we make, we will not be able to make all of them ever, let alone that we don't have the time to do that. Um, we as the world community, we have about 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 molecules. Um, and I don't need to remind you of your high school math, 10 to the 7 is a lot less than 10 to the 60. So how can we begin to fill this gap? And this field has been pioneered by jean louis Raymond at the University of Bern, um, because what mathematicians will tell you that this is actually an easy problem, because a molecule is a graph, which is called the nodes, atoms, and the edges, bonds. And so mathematicians usually have computer programs which exhaustively and guaranteed exhaustively completely enumerate all possible graphs up to a certain number of nodes that you put in. And then they say, well, okay, then you just populate every node with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, whatever fits your desire, and there you are, you have all the molecules that are possible. Now, the chemists among you, of course, know that a molecule that has 18 atoms and consists of only oxygen is not very likely to ever exist, let alone be useful in a pharmaceutical context. And what Jean-Louis has been doing is he went out from these graphs and has introduced very, very strict synthesis rules um, how, to, how to ensure that these molecules might actually be synthesizable. Um, we are not as good a medicinal chemist as, as Sean Rui is, and so we asked ourselves, well, can we somehow make this an easier job? And this is something that has also been done by, by other people, for instance, this real database um, that, that Enamine offers and that BioSolvaT has the nice search tool for, their, their ligand-based search tool for. This is exactly in the same spirit. 
um, with a bit different reactions and a bit different uh, building blocks. So whatever suits your fancy, you might choose between one of these databases. So the basic principle is that you have building blocks and we go, went back to our legal playing days. Um, we have a set of 58 robust reactions. So these are the, the classical student lab course reactions where nobody gets hurt and nobody gets blown up. And you get a set of diverse products. This is one of the few computational areas where combinatorics is actually in your favor. Usually you, you want to avoid combinatorics, but um, here we, we make use of it because we get a lot of molecules. And we started out with a library of 8,000 um, fragments, these 58 reactions, and we already end up with 21 million compounds. So this is, also this is far less than 10 to the power of 60, but we are getting into the right direction and you don't need gigantic libraries of building blocks to do that. We have a second library um, based on 25,000 um, molecule of uh, building blocks, which has about 250 million um, products in it. Now, what you can do with this is, and now I'm going back to the better toward energy receptor and the fragment that I have shown you before. So this is the 20 micromolar fragment. And we thought, well, can we just expand this fragment with the help of the computer? So we took our database of building blocks, the 8,000. We let the receptor decide by a docking which ones of these fragments it liked best, so which are compatible with the binding pocket. We come up with a number of compatible building blocks, and then through a strategy that we call growing via merging, um, and which I'm going to explain to you in a second, um, we picked reductive amination because there is this very nice amine here which you can reductively aminate. And we did this both in the computer, but also with the help of our local medicinal chemistry, Kididarich, in the real beaker. And this is the molecule that came out. This is the most potent one of eight that we synthesized. It is 0.4 micromolar, 0.5 micromolar, which is a 40-fold improvement. And we have a total of eight molecules. Of note, we were able to make all of them, all of the molecules that we suggested. Um, and we have three more derivatives with at least a 10-fold improvement. So th and this was done extremely automatically. Um, Docking was allowed to, to choose which fragments should be the extensions, and then we just um, had them synthesized. So how does this GVM, this growing via merging work? So our strategy is first to transform the building blocks. So what I haven't told you here is for reductive amination, you need a mean on one side, and on the other side, you need a carbonyl. It can be an aldehyde or a ketone. So what we first do is if you dock the aldehyde or the ketone, you will have slightly different hydrogen bonding properties than in the final molecule. Because if you react the amine with the, the carbonyl, just the amine will remain. And so what we do is we transform all the building blocks to what we call surrogate. So what will this building block look like once it has reacted? And in this case, the surrogate is just the amine. With a ketone, you will get uh, an, an um, there is um, a rest, sorry, you will get um, a product with an anisomeric carbon, um, and of course in the racemic mixture. Uh, but you can also dock these, and um, you introduce this chiral center here, which we usually try to avoid. So the surrogates are then docked, and we prune the ones that are incorrectly oriented. I will show you a picture in a second. Then the entire product is redocked. This sounds trivial, but we think that this is a key step um, in order to verify that there's post fidelity because what we want to do, or we, we are laboring under the assumption that every, even the extension is completely happy in the binding mode that it is in the binding pocket. So this is the original fragment. This is what I have shown you before. This is binding to the aspartate 113. And now, we have docked all the surrogates without this in place, but just for comparison, I will leave it in here. And so this is what one of these surrogate dockings looks like. We just do not get one pose. We deliberately try to generate hundreds and thousands of poses. And so these are a few of them. And you see that most of them are oriented with nitrogen down towards where the nitrogen should be if you consider the re fully reacted product. However, there are also some poses, such as the two I'm pointing to here, where the nitrogen is pointing upwards. 
And so these are synthetically not productive, so we want to prune them in the next step and only be left with this particular fragment as a potential extension in case we have poses left which are synthetically productive. And then we, we do the reaction in silico um, and we redock the entire fragment. Uh, sorry, the, the entire product. So this is what's depicted here in yellow carbons and verify that this has still has the same binding mode. So this works very nicely and you don't need specialized software for that. Um, you could in theory do that with any old docking program that you have, um, but this is just a strategy that, that we have been using for that. And um, you can do that with any of the databases that I have mentioned. Um, if you want to use our database and you have to cook the molecules yourself, if you use the real database, then Enamine is doing the job for you, which might or might, might not uh, be interesting for you. Now I'm going to show you a bit of um, a glimpse of a study that we have just been undertaking. And this is, can we make this even more systematically? And so we try to um, explore the better to a binding site with the orthosteric site here in, at, the, at the bottom left, um, and we just call these other secondary and tertiary binding pocket. And how we do this is we dock ligands and we keep them for the initial um, way if one of, the, um, of one of the parts is interacting in a nice favorable binding modes. It doesn't really matter if the B part is, is not so favorable. So this is building block one and building block two. We call them usually building block A and building block B. Now, once we have identified a nice anchor point, nice group A, um, we will then extend it with several different Bs. And we will also want to make sure that once we have chosen these Bs, they are compatible with several As, so that we have a nice matrix of As times B fragments. And if we want to blow this up to the full matrix, um, in this way we have identified that there are two different reactions that are compatible with different extension directions, so the secondary and the tertiary binding pocket. So these two reactions are reductive amination and amine formation. We chose five fragments A for each of these reactions that go to the um, orthoteric pocket. We have 24 Bs, which are supposed to explore the secondary and the tertiary binding pocket. If you do the math, we wanted to synthesize 240 products. Now we did that in collaboration with a company in Dortmund here, Taros, who is specialized in um, synthesizing um, molecules, but there are many other vendors out there who, who will be delighted to do that for you. And so if you look at the yields that we got for these two series, on the left you see the amide series, and the greener, the, the purer, and the more product we got. And you can see that for the amide series this worked really, really well. Uh, not so much for the amine series. And the, the reason for that is that, so this was all one set of reaction conditions, zero optimization. Um, the reason for that was that under these reaction conditions, usually you have um, a reactivity ranking that the primary amine is the most reactive, then the secondary amine is the second most reactive, then comes the tertiary amine and so forth. Here it was the not quite the case, so the primary was still the most reactive, but then the secondary amine, uh, sorry, the, the, no, the secondary amine was more reactive than the primary. So we, we were left with a solution that had primary amine and tertiary amine, but not the desired secondary amine. We optimized the conditions a bit and resynthesized, and you see we got a couple more green spots, and then we also extended the series with an additional four different B building blocks in order to optimize uh, the compounds. And we assayed all of these um, ligands that we got, uh, sorry, these molecules that we got, 147 in total, we assayed in the assay that I've shown you before um, against the two different conformations of the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And so we, we can see whether a certain molecule might be rather an agonist or rather an inverse agonist, and we find all kinds of these molecules. So these are actually example plots of what they look like. And in the end, I'm not going to show you the structures because this is unpublished. In the end, what we get is such a, um, such a, a, a matrix of compounds. And if you see it's, if the background is yellow, it's an antagonist, which means it has approximately the same um, affinity for both of the conformations. In green, this would be agonists. And in red, this would be inverse agonists. And 
this is very rich SAR, as you can imagine, because every A and every B is part of multiple um, different molecules. And also, this matrix layout immediately points to, you know, the molecules that were not synthesized in the beginning, like the central ones here. But if you look at this row, you see that depending on the A that you have, you have antagonist, agonist, inverse agonist, would be extremely nice or extremely interesting to make this particular molecule, and that's what we did. Um, we know now with the initial SAR, what, is, what are the molecules that we need to optimize? And this is very powerful, it's very guiding. Um, it allows you to very, very precisely predict what you want to do and what you want to synthesize next and which molecules you want to make. So none of these molecules um, is particularly novel in terms of synthetic strategy. Um, they're all the ones that I'm not showing you right now, but none of them has been synthesized before, as we know from SciFinder, and none of them has been described as a better to an energy binder before. So there is a lot of unexplored chemical space right around the corner, so to speak. And I think that's why it's worthwhile doing these things. And I'd rather have lots of molecules that might not might be trivial to make in a sense um, so not exciting for a diehard organic chemist but they're very informative in terms of SAR so to sum up this part um, I think the one amazing thing was also the how fast we were so compound docking took less than 24 hours on the computer a single postdoc picked the entire molecules the entire 240 within three weeks so this is, these are not three calendar weeks, but of course three full-time equivalent weeks. Synthesis took two weeks. Um, the second week, because we tried to repurify some of the amine pro reductive amination products. The assay was done within a week. And the total compound cost was around about 8,000 euros because Taurus did this as a collaborative project with us. Um, so they did not um, charge us for the, for, the, for the woman power in this case, um, but they, um, they, they, they contributed this in kind, but still I consider this very much um, affordable. And the cool thing is because of these, this rich SAR, the resynthesis and this additional four times four matrix that we have, we ended up with a molecule that is a 520 nanomolar binder. Again, this is not sub nanomolar, this is not drug quality, but this is just one round of optimization. And if you, again, compare this to adrenaline, adrenaline is around about 100 nanomolar, we are getting there very, very rapidly. So with this, I'm already at the end of this presentation of this introduction into chemical space and what our strategies are to navigate chemical space. Um, and as I said, these, these are just teasers and, and um, there are many other strategies that you can use. And we also strongly believe that first using structure-based methods and then following up for the other low-hanging fruit with similarity search methods is, is a very good idea because you can just expand the base on which you're doing synthesis. And I hope I could show you that GPCRs and structure-based methods go really well together. I showed you a little bit about the potent compounds that we have, the high heat rates that we find, um, that we routinely find novel chemotypes and that we can also enter into chemical space and find completely novel molecules. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation and I'm very excited if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Peter, so much for this wonderful presentation. That was an excellent talk. Um, let me see. I think we have, uh, there's one question so far. Uh, so regarding docking the surrogate uh, amine fragments, can you elaborate on the advantages it has compared to directly docking the full virtual products? Okay, I was just trying to find where I can see the question, but I, I think I have it. Um, whoopsie, now I lost it. It's uh, in the questions box. Yeah. Okay, um, so we think, so this is because um, we believe that there are so many, op so many options for potential extensions. Um, now, you could do what has just been asked, so you create the product and then you dock it. But then, you would not be sure that every single fragment of the two fragments is in its favorite spot. So we are a bit more elitist in this sense, and we, we say we want to find the optimal spot, for, or we want to test whether there is an optimal spot for each extension. 
And only if such an extension or a binding mode exists that does not overlap with the base fragment, we make the reaction and then we redock and confirm that this is indeed still binding like that. It's a bit of, of you know, compensation of, of a good, very good fragment could compensate for, for a suboptimal fragment. And anyway, you get so many suggestions that you can, you can prune at very early stages. This is our rationale behind that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, why did it take three weeks for compound selection? <laughs> I consider it very fast, but the question sounds as if this is a, a really long time. Um, this was also based on the, on the constraints that we have. So we have to find five fragments for each reaction. And then we have to find 24 extensions, which are compatible synthetically, but also sterically with each of these five fragments, these, these five core fragments or, or base fragments, if you want. Um, and then of course, you can imagine these are not just, we took the top 240, but we valued a lot of them for, for mutual compatibility. And so this is the set that we came up with. So this is, this is an, a balance between works with every other. So th th these are all mutually compatible. It was not, um, just cherry picking, but we wanted to have this matrix layout, and we think that this is a very powerful way of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, then the next question is What are the components of the docking score you implemented? Have you developed an algorithm to decide on the best strategy to choose best ranking strategy? So we use out of the box docking software um, in my lab because I, I postdoc with uh, Brian Schoikert, we use doc. Um, and so this is a biophysical scoring method from the Waals electrostatics and, and desolvation. Um, but in, in general, my stance towards docking software is whatever you are most familiar with will probably work best in your, in, in your hands. And for the, for the docking, the, the fragments, we use something that gives you a lot of pauses. In, in our case, it was a software called Seed. Okay, then... Uh... I, am, I assume the protein is rigid while you did the docking. How flexible is the GPCR's orthoth orthosteric binding site in general? Um, depends on who you ask. In general, and, and well, I have to say, I answer these questions to the extent that we know right now, because we have, I don't know, a hundred crystal structures of a dozen or so GPCRs. So this might completely change in three years from now. Um, for the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, the, um, the difference between an agonist bound structure and an inverse agonist bound structure is a compression of the binding pocket of about an angstrom, a little bit less. I would call that a small change, but I have, you know, also people have told me, no, that's a huge change. So I guess it's in the eye of the beholder. I think they're quite rigid to a pretty good approximation, actually. Mm -hmm. Then, um, uh, regarding an APO structure, have you tried to dock the initial fragment and then grow to simulate a de novo search? Yes, that, that's essentially what we, well, we, we haven't done the, the, the real, the growing part, but this is a bit what, what the last study was, where we started from scratch. So we, we did not start from any experimentally verified fragments, but we just picked everything in silico and then um, did the testing, but we we have not done the growing by emerging purely in silico. Um, well, I mean, it, it started because the the first fragment that we found, um, we had the experimental verification that it is indeed a binder in between. So mm -hmm. yeah, but we could have we could have gone right on and and tried to do that. Mm -hmm. Then somebody wants to know how a pharmacophore-based search with excluded volumes would compare uh, to a docking in, in your case. Good question. We haven't done that, so um, I don't know. But I know that a lot of people do very, very nice um, ligand searches for GPCRs with pharmacophore models. So since the pharmacophore model is... Oh, well, since the pharmacophore for better to adrenergic ligands is relatively well described, I would assume that this would also give quite high hit rates. Whether you would have found all these novel chemotypes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then we have another question. It is known that GPCRs can move the TM regions upon binding and this can open different binding sites. How can we consider this dynamic effect for docking in the alternative binding sites? So what we are doing is the, the only chance that I see in the absence of, of crystal structures that really where we can see that um, is to run molecular dynamic simulations and, and go for snapshots. Mm -hmm. Uh, then somebody wants to know whether you had different binding pockets for the different fragments. So, for example, fragment A, you did pocket um, one, uh, then another pocket for fragment B, and so forth. No, um, this was this was actually one of the criteria. So we allowed for the for the B fragments, we allowed the entire pocket, and if the binding mode would have overlapped with an A fragment, um, we just didn't allow it. So we we, we pruned that. Mm -hmm. Then how about entropy loss uh, when you link the fragments? Did you consider that? Not explicitly, just mm -hmm. implicitly. We, we were thinking about that, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, we didn't, we, there, there was no score for that. Okay. And then last question, have you thought about combining your docking approach with something like the enamine space? Um, yes, uh, we, we are actually, so, First of all, our database and their database in spirit is very similar. And I saw, I think, in the in the upcoming um, that, that Yuri Moros is, is giving an, a presentation, um, the next webinar, I think. Maybe Karsten can confirm that. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll uh, say something about yeah. that in a second. Okay, good. So so we, we are also, we're talking to them regularly and um, we are trying this on a different target with them. But any database is, is, is good in that case. So what, whatever works and is available. I mean, that's, I think the key thing is you have to get your molecules. Only a virtual molecule is worth nothing. Only once you have it as a substance and you can test it, it, it starts to become mildly interesting. Okay. Um, so that I think pretty much concludes the presentation and question part. Thanks again very much to you, Peter, for, for the excellent talk and, and sharing your, your exciting results here. Um, Thanks for having me.